Hello, hello, and welcome to the Be the CEO of Your Life live show. I'm Yvonne Dam of Amazing Self Coaching, and I help driven entrepreneurs to elevate their business to their next level. So by focusing on what really matters, they get more time, they get more clients, and their income comes up. And I'm bringing in this show guests who share with you how they have done it. I'm sharing personal experiences, and I'm very excited because today I have a very special guest. Mark is here with me. Hi, Mark. Hello, Yvonne. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, Mark, for those who are watching and who don't know you, can you give a brief introduction of who you are and what you do? Okay, so I, my name is Mark Hayward. I am a, a multiple business owner um, in podcast, podcast businesses, coaching, and in property. Right, okay. So I, I love that already, and we're going to touch on that. But I want to kick off with the name of this show, right? The CEO of your life. Now, I see you clearly as someone who is the CEO of his life. But tell me, how do you see that or how do you feel about it? So for me, it's a it's a journey that I've been on in the last sort of eight or nine years where I started becoming obsessed by reading audiobooks, podcasts, and, and learning and developing skills and developing um practices and tools, tactics and, and techniques. And for me, it was a journey where I started to take control of my career and business. Um, and, and for me, that's what CEO of, of your life means, that you're, you've got control of your businesses, yourself, and, and being able to deliver high quality products and services to your clients. Yeah. I, 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 I remember that when we met, you were still employed, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 the journey uh from to from corporate to uh to a business owner happened on the 16th of October 2020 um but that had always already kind of been put into place already I'd had the podcast uh, for a number of years um I had started coaching sort of very low level stuff because I had a corporate career so I couldn't fully fledged go into it but it was a long journey covid sort of delayed it for about six months because i really wasn't sure where it was going to land us but i felt in the in summer last year i had a three-month um uh, term till i had to finish um that i was ready and able to be able to take that step uh that big step uh out of corporate something i'd known for uh 15 years or so to actually take that step and actually start their bus businesses but the businesses had already started really before I'd left uh, but it was really kicking that into into sort of main main steam ahead and and, and and working hard on doing that yeah and and how do you like it oh I love it the flexibility we talked about this a lot and 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 when I was talking to you you were saying that you need to you you can direct what you do i still work as hard as i did in corporate it's just in different uh, different cycles and different uh time periods that i do it sometimes it's very intensive for sort of a two three hour period and then that might mean then lunch with my kids or my wife or something like that and then doing that sometimes into the evening depending on that sort of childcare and stuff like that so um the flexibility is the thing for me that makes it very appealing. And equally, that whole point, it sounds very cliched, but the cliches for a point is because um, when you're your own business owner, you're, you're, you're kind of dictated by the market. You're, if you're good, you will be successful in your businesses rather than um, in a corporate where it's, so many, it's, it's layered in so many different levels about influencing people and persuading people that it's not always about what you're delivering, which is something that now I've started the the, the businesses and, and running them, I appreciate that a lot more and not having to deal with the persuasion and influencing key people to get yourself promoted. 
Yeah, I, I, it's, it's great that you say that because it's true, right? When you're in a corporate, you really have to network a lot and you need to make sure that you get the people on your side. And then when you're up for promotion, you really need to play the strategic game so you actually can grow further. But if they have a bad day or the numbers are behind, then all of a sudden you can start all over again. And, yeah. and it, you know, in your business, it's very true. If you're good at what you do, you, you will succeed as long as you also believe in it, because I, I think that's quite critical. Um, but it's a very different ball game. Yeah, it is. And, and the, it's, it's termed by some as politics. I don't necessarily agree with it as politics, but at the start of when I really started the journey in my career, I actually quite enjoyed that that um, analysis and sort of understanding people's personalities and how to influence, how to get advocates and support. Um, but I started getting very tired of it. It, it, it became it became quite a, an uphill struggle just to get the right people on the right board it, it just ended up being um a, a, a difficulty but as i said at the start i really enjoyed it i i, I did a psychology a levels um at, at school so i did enjoy the psychology and i still enjoy the psychology of business and the psychology of learning and and knowledge so i've just sort of transferred that skill set into something slightly different now running businesses yeah yeah i like that okay so while we were prepping about this you said to me okay you know i went from a win-lose perspective to a win-win and i think a lot of people can really really win from a perspective like that but you know tell me a bit more about what your outlook on life was that you call it win-lose and how that has changed now to win-win and then what other people can take away from it I think there's a lot of people out there that, like me, got brought up with a sporting influence throughout my my teenage years and into my twenties. And I always thought, um, in that mindset of that, either you won and your whoever you're working with lost, and 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 it started it started to change when, even in my career, when I realised that if I win and someone else wins. That doesn't mean that I'm being hurt by, by by them winning as well. But it really is powerful to me, that mindset shift that I got in in business where it's not a sporting game. It's, it's a different game that you're playing. And, and, and I can win and the client can win by, by me winning the, the business and them having a great service. So for me, there was a definite shift um, in my mindset where I, I needed to turn it around into, into the, I need to win as well as my client. And that's the success. That's a successful journey that you need to, to look towards. Um, and sort of sporting analogies do, are useful to a point. Um, but there's a, there's a greater complexity in business. And, and for me, that shift that if I win and the client wins, then, then everyone is happy. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, a win-win uh, perspective, that's something we all need as a business owner, I think, um, because when you are having a win-lose perspective and you're trying to gain a client, that's actually quite sad. <laughs> because, you know, the client loses from hiring you. I don't, I don't think that that goes well. And I think the, the more successful your clients becomes, the more successful you become as well. Now, if we look at your screen, I, I see your podcast logo behind you, and your, you know, I, I, we can't even see your mic, but I know you're, you know, yeah, you're, yeah it's over here. It's fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're big on podcasting. You you have a very great running podcast. You have a podcast company. Tell us a bit more about that because I think. Um, for many people, a podcast is still very daunting. You know, it's 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 quite nice to listen to, but to have one is another thing. So, if I'm if I'm a business owner listening, why would I need a podcast? So there's either two ways to approach it. So let me tell you a little bit about my podcast. So I'm coming up to four years on doing it, done over 330 episodes. Um, it started as a as a hobby. Um, I wanted to talk about business, what's happening to me, and and started it even in my career. And um, 
And it was really a mechanism to learn skills and develop myself uh, from a technical, from like the microphone and the camera, but equally it made me, in a way, it kind of made me feel a lot more comfortable in my own skin. I could talk and and be able to um, do do these off cuff conversations with people and be have an element of confidence in what you're doing. I always remember um, I started it and and in the it just shows you the serendipity of these sorts of situations. I then was asked to talk in front of about 160 people about the products that I was selling. And because I'd prepared podcasts and and knew how to structure it, it meant doing a talk for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it was, uh, really helped me because I had that sort of comfort level in there. But for me, podcasting can be split into two things. And this is what I try and do. I, I, I help people. I train people to become a podcaster. Yeah. Which- which is a particular skill set in itself. And I, I teach an end-to-end process of everything from your idea to monetizing and everything in between. I, I teach people. If people want to start their own podcast, I think they should. I think you need to, a couple of things you need to have is um, you need to have the right um, equipment. It doesn't have to be terribly expensive, but you do need to have decent equipment. You equally have to have a passion for what you're talking about and consistency is one of the biggest things in podcasting release on the same day every week or or every other week depending on how regularly you want to do it i do twice a week now i was up to four four short ones and one interview uh but i've scaled that back to two so there's there's that there which and 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 for me the podcast the interviews have really just expanded my mind i i talked to across the board of industries and I've deliberately kept it very broad because um, although most people tell you to niche and I kind of do tell people to niche, I've enjoyed the breadth of conversations with people and and I've, I've created friends, I've created um, colleagues, I've created JV partners, all from people that I've I've interviewed. So for me, it's, it's developed beyond uh, uh, just a podcast and it's a it's a real way of being able to create strong relationships with people. So there's that on the podcast side to actually be a guest. So one of my other business is that I help people be guests on other people's podcasts. Now that's, that's a lot easier than, than creating your own podcast. But the benefit of that is it's a marketing tool. You are able to build up a, so we do either 24 or 48 podcasts in a year and we match you to the right type of podcast whether you want to talk about leadership technology uh, whatever it is we, we we can cover on that now that we we took me and my business partner to talk about the google effect and what we find is and what we found because my business partner did 60 interviews in one year with his team so i come from the podcast experience side of knowing how to do it he comes from the guest side and and what we've found is that once you've built up a knowledge, uh, once you've built up a bank of podcasts that you've been on, when people Google you and, and they want to maybe start start uh, as a client of yours or something, like that, most people now Google people. Yeah. And there might be LinkedIn, there might be Facebook, there might be Twitter, whatever it is. But what you find if you're a, if you're a serial guest on people's podcasts is, that there's also all of your podcasts on the on that Google search. And that gives people an insight into your knowledge, into your skills, into how your mindset, how you approach things. And, and we have generated business from being on podcasts. So we know that it works. It's not always like a lot of people think, oh, I'll go on a leadership podcast as a leadership coach, for example, and I'm gonna get a client. It's not, it's not quite as straightforward as that. What you need to do is get a lot of content, be a, be a content leader, be, a, be, a, be someone that's knowledgeable and authoritative on your subject. And what you'll find is when people do start working with you or want to start working with you, that search, that Google effect that you can have really gives people a rounded view on your expertise, your experience, and, and that's what generates clients by by you being the authority on that subject. I love that. I love it. And I also love that you mentioned that yes, you 
can monetize podcasts or being a guest on podcasts, but it's not as easy as going on one, talking about one thing one time, and then ka-ching, the money comes in. Because- well, you, know, you know, Yvonne, like any business that you start, you, like it's it's the whole, like you plant a tree, you don't turn up the next day and expect it to be grown fully. It just yeah. never happens that way. People still think that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, it's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> It's a, it's funny, right? And, and and I think that's the same with podcasts, actually. People think, okay, so I'll, I'm starting my podcast. Oh, where are my clients now? You know, why is it not happening now? <laughs> but it's with well, everything. I, I to people, and, 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 and I heard this on a, on someone who was uh, a prolific YouTuber, and, um, and he said, he was doing an interview and someone said to him i get i get so many requests from people to um to help them and um and he says what i say to them is release a hundred episodes on youtube so it could be podcasts as well a hundred guest bots or a hundred podcasts and then go to an expert and say how how am i doing because then you can see development you can see your your confidence building and then at 100 episodes you've been through the process so many times any feedback you get then um i think really adds a huge amount of value so when i when i teach people podcasts i say you've got to think of it like a business to two to five years to commit to doing a podcast do it commit in your brain to 100 or 50 podcasts and then look for advice because you learn so much by doing like it's so much in business is about doing like there's a uh, i'm i love audiobooks i love podcasts i love learning but you've got to action it as well there is a there is that element that some people struggle with and they just learn and learn and learn to be very academic on it yeah, yeah. Read all the books but they never action what you need to do on there so it's really important that whether you want to be a guest or you want to run your own podcast to really commit to it in your mind that yes it's a marketing uh, tool just like facebook ads or, or or organic posts on linkedin whatever it is but you've got to commit to doing it to really learn the craft learn the skills and then you'll find uh, um sort of marketing leads will be generated from them yeah i like that a lot so mark we've got a question and i think it's quite a long one so we're going to be out of um, <laughs> it's going to be taking up oh no it's small so clay says i'm in a partnership with three others we have a young manufacturing startup we don't have a ceo but have an operations manager who reports to us in each of four portfolios do you think in the long term this is advisable? If not, how can we do it differently without causing friction? Okay, so I think, Mark, this is quite a nice leeway to get into your other business, which is coaching of startups, right? Yeah. So so for Clay, I would say he's not actually explained what his role is in this in this setup. So um Oh, sorry. I was going to put you on there. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant in live, isn't it? <laughs> um, I've started to play with this recently, but now there you go. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so Clay, I would say you've not really described what your role is within there. I think there should be, um, as founders of the business, I think you should really think about the roles and responsibilities that you have um in that business um operation manager is really useful i always go back to uh the e-myth uh by michael gerber where he says there's an in, in, the e-myth is entrepreneur myth and there's three areas you should be thinking about the entrepreneurial side the managerial side the operation side and then the technician so i'll just break that down let's go the other direction so the technician is the doer is so if it was Um, if it was manufacturing, it would be the people that are actually manufacturing, the the people doing the role. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have, you need managers in there that are looking after them and building systems and processes to be able to be, um, to to make sure that that the the technicians are working on the right level. And then you have the entrepreneur side, which is probably and should be you or your business partner, which is driving thinking about sales and marketing, thinking about business development, thinking about how you can develop that business 
and and often young businesses and and it's it's very common you you end up being all three and i would say try and get out of one of those definitely um because i think you should be on the entrepreneurial side which is building businesses and and maybe um scaling businesses or adapting to to pivot to make your your product or service uh successful so if you think about it as those three different levels, it sounds like you've got the right person as the operations manager. It sounds like you've got the manufacturing side sorted as well. You now have to sit uh, uh, as the CEO, as the founder, and, and need to think about how you develop that business and to be able to, in, 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 in the dream state, you build it to the growth level where you're ready to scale with either investment or building your business that way. Love it. Okay, so you did see that Clay is the marketing director, right? I, I saw that after when it came across. So yes, I did see that in the end. So so yeah. So if you've got if you've got yourself as the marketing director and your your other partner is another role within this sort of executive board of that business, that's the right place for you to be on. You want to think strategic. You want to think about how to develop, grow the business through sales and marketing. So for you. I would say you've got the operation side sorted, which is great because that's often the bit that people struggle with more than anything. Yeah. Um, I, I, I always give the example of, of a baker. So you have a baker who bakes the bread and, and you might be absolutely passionate about baking bread. But you have to then understand that you're probably not going to grow to a to a, a business where you have 20, 50 stores because you love that. And if you do love that, that's absolutely fine as well. But you have the baker, you have the, the shop owner who deals with the clients and, and deals with the, the processes of the bread coming out. And then you have the entrepreneur side of it, who is actually the, the, the person who's looking for the future strategically, how to grow that business. I love it. Okay, I think this was the best example we could have, Mark, about you <laughs> in action as a coach. <laughs> so first let me ask Clay, does this answer your question? Or if you have any further questions, let, let us know. Um, but it's really what you do, Mark. You, you coach entrepreneurs who have great startup ideas. Um, well, talk about it yourself because you can explain it better than me. Yeah, so I've got the seven stages of a startup, which... Um, I, I, it's very foundational at the start. It's about how to set up a business a limited company, how to uh, put all the p pieces in place, the accountant, the lawyer, the, 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 the all those sorts of frameworks in. Um, and it really takes you through that step before you've even launched a business because there's things that you need. There's building blocks that you need in place before you launch. But it sounds like Clay is in the right place because sales and marketing, you can do your market research at, at stage four. And it's really important that you do and you understand whether you whether your business is actually viable. The whole what I've see often is people think they've got a great idea, but they never validate that business. Does anyone actually want to buy that product or service, which is sometimes lost? People get lost in building a fantastic website and they never really think about how they bring people beyond that. They, 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 they spend like a couple of thousand pounds on a website and they go, oh, I've got no, no, no clients. Well, actually, that's only one mechanism of being able to create a marketing funnel and, and create generate leads that which turn into clients with sales. So, so if I, I take you through those steps, and, and once you've launched, you then loop back to sales and marketing on step seven because that equally is once you've launched and you've tried a, and given it six, 12 months, probably six months to see if it's working, you want to then look at your, your marketing strategy and is it working? Are you actually being, are you generating leads? Are, are you getting converted into sales? So, so for me, building those businesses, it's so much fun because what I find at the start is it's very mentoring. I'm, I'm sort of telling people, some people have had careers and don't really know the foundational sides of setting up businesses. Some people do, but some people struggle with that. And what it evolves into, which is really, really nice, through, through relationships of six to 12 months, that person is the expert on their subject, on their industry, whatever they're talking about. And what you what, what the relationship evolves into is 
somewhere something that I'm sort of enabling, helping people, guiding people, but they're driving the agenda. And sometimes you you sort of need to sort of say, hold up a second, you're you're spreading yourself too thin, or you're you're not focusing in. But that sort of re-loop on your sales and marketing is so powerful and can be so impactful for your business. Okay, great. So Clay does says that it indeed oh. answers the question. So that's good to know. Okay. Now, I love that you spoke about, you know, your podcasting business, which is actually twofold. You spoke about your coaching business for startups and you have a third business, which is real estate. Yes. Yeah. So, so this was a, this was a, a, a fortuitous um, um, exploit that I, I started. I, I actually inherited a property and, um, and what I ended up doing was um, leveraging the equity in the business, uh, in, in, in the property and st- bought some more properties. So it, it, it evolved from something quite unfortunate with a, with a death, but mm-hmm. I was then able to make an opportunity out of it. And what I like about the property side is uh, just to tell you, so I, I own my own properties. I also now source properties for investors as well. That's just with my knowledge building, I was then able to package things together, real estate deals or wholesaling in the US, they call it, uh, properties for other people. And what I like about the property side is um, it is something very different to the rest of my business. So podcasts, the podcast business and coaching are sort of intertwined with each other. And one of the sort of techniques of multiple streams of income, which is what I think most most business people should be employing is that the property side is is not related to the other three businesses and therefore it's not going to be impacted in the same way when recessions or when difficult times come around it's some like we never know with recessions is it going to hit property is it going to hit banking is it going to what like airlines have struggled in obviously airlines and hospitality have struggled in in the pandemic but what I liked about it is that that, that point is, is separate and will not be impacted by the same market forces. So for me, it works really well. And that, that was something that I was taught um, a few years back now. And, um, and it's been incredibly powerful. And I would advise that that whole point of diversification, it doesn't need to be property or real estate. It could be it could be um, stocks. Um, it could be um bitcoin it could be crypto and um, there are lots of you could speculate with um with um, um cars or with um uh, watches there are lots of different variants of art there's lots of different variants on having that sort of investment side as well so i would say um it, it is a good it's a good place and real estate is a, a property is is one of the more stable sides of that that sort of business investment. So I would say I would advise most people, even if you've got your own business, to think about a way of being able to be an investor as well into into something, whether it is stocks, whether it's crypto, whether it's property, whatever it is, just to be able to be resilient and diversify your businesses across across different industries. Okay, cool. So um. Leaving your website here, um, which I, I think kind of sums it up, absolute business mindset. One thing, I, I was already smiling, but for people that may not know you, you are located in the UK. I am. Thank you, excellent. In a way. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm based in London. I've been based in London pretty much most of my life, uh, different parts of London. But yes, it's, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, is, is my accent confusing? No, it's not at all, but I just have to laugh because I think everybody will hear clearly that you're from the UK, but okay. <laughs> you will not hear it then for, for, you know, just to be clear, you are based in the UK and you're talking about British real estate as well. But that yeah. you can help people. US, US real estate is different, but it's similar in lots of ways as well. There's, there's, it, the US market is, uh, when, when you talk, when, when you listen to people like Grant Cardone, who buys these huge complexes where people live in. We just don't have that in the UK market. So um, it's every every country is different. It's like Germany don't really own properties. Mm-hmm. They, they rent their properties out. Um, where in the UK, we have this obsession by owning our own properties. Um, so um, 
uh, yeah, it, it, it's it, it, it is different. Every every market is different because even to break down the the UK market or the English market, there's there's difference between being based in London versus being based up north. It's a huge difference, a huge market. And the one thing I would say about property is work out, and this is whatever uh, country you're in, work out your gold mine area, your area that you want to invest in and you want to research and understand. Often it's where people live helps as a starting point um, because it's just easier to, to manage. But um, yeah, I, I would work on your gold mine area, work and learn and understand the roads, um, where the where the, the train stations are, um, where the schools are, where the hospitals are, all those sorts of things are really important to understand when you're getting involved in real estate or property. Okay, well, I think this is a great closing line. Work on your gold mine area. You know, I think this is what we're going to end the show with. Mark, is there anything, because we're running over time, that you want to, as a final statement, you want to share with people? I think for me, the biggest change for me to to get to become a business owner and be successful was mindset. And I think it's something that you really need to work on whether you've got a bad um, view of money, whether you think people with money is uh, greedy or those sorts of, you need to change that mindset to be, um, to have a growth mindset and always learn. But the critical thing, which we covered a little bit earlier is um, you need to action as well. Only through action will you ever be able to achieve uh, and reach your potential. Okay, I love this. So this is what we're going to close with. You need to have the right mindset, but I'll take aligned action because that will get you further. Mark, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Yvonne. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll be here tomorrow again, same time, same place. See you later. Goodbye for now. Bye.